Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining our webinar as we bring IBD experts here to answer COVID-19 questions that are on your mind. Tonight's discussion is a closer look at COVID-19 and its impact specifically on people living with IBD, how that data is captured and analyzed. You will find this discussion absolutely fascinating. Many of you may know that this week is National Volunteer Week. I wanna share with you that Crohn's and Clytus Canada was founded in 1974 by concerned parents hoping to help their children and others living with Crohn's or colitis. These volunteers organized what is now Crohn's and Clytus Canada, and that small local group would grow to over 3,000 volunteers from coast to coast. We've come a long way since 1974 because of our amazing volunteers who invest their time, talent, and passion to make it better for everyone living with IBD. On behalf of everyone affected by Crohn's or colitis, we sincerely thank our volunteers for their dedication and commitment, and we recognize that we would not have come this far without their love and care. This year's theme for National Volunteer Week is we applaud our volunteers. But to us at Crohn's and Clytus Canada, our volunteers deserve a standing ovation. You bring our promise to life, to cure Crohn's and colitis and to improve the quality of life of children and adults affected by these chronic diseases. The Crohn's and Clytus family is at the heart of what we do and why we do it. Our work focuses on supporting and advancing critical research and delivering programs that help people living with Crohn's or colitis today. As part of our COVID-19 response efforts, we've expanded our COVID-19 online resources, and we continue to bring you these weekly webinars to help you keep informed and safe during the situation. Next week, we will be introducing a webinar for healthcare providers in another effort to further support the IBD community. This closed webinar will provide a means for professionals to discuss issues and solutions in order to provide the best care during the COVID-19 pandemic. Please tell your healthcare provider about this webinar and encourage them to register. If you haven't already, please follow our at Get Gutsy Canada social media challenge channels to stay informed. A big thank you to our task force who also volunteer their time and skills to discuss policies and recommendations necessary for our community during these times. Thank you today to the, to, thank you to today's panelists, Dr. Erica Brenner and Dr. Michael Kaplman. And of course, much appreciation to our fantastic moderators again. Dr. Gail Kaplan, Professor of Medicine, University of Calgary. He's an adult gastroenterologist and epidemiologist. He is the chair of our Scientific Medical Advisory Council as well as a board director with Crohn's and Clytus Canada. And Dr. Eric Benjamal, who is an associate professor and gastroenterologist, Department of Pediatrics and School of Epidemiology and Public Health at the University of Ottawa, Division of Gastroenterology at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario. He is also chair-elect of our Scientific Medical Advisory Council. Thank you both. Thank you, Mina. Thank you, Mina. Um, yeah, so this is exciting. This is now our sixth week that we've hosted these webinars. Um, and uh, this one is actually going to be a very special um, webinar because we have two amazing panelists, uh, Dr. Erica Brenner and Dr. Michael Kaplman, um, who are clinician scientists who are leading the development of the, of the IBD Secure uh, COVID registry. Um, and so it's going to be really exciting to be able to share with you the data that they've collected. Um, and to be able to ask some questions um, around um, this process, their database, and some of the data that they're that they're presenting. So this is going to be a really great webinar. And Gil, they're both pediatric gastroenterologists, I might add. Although it's not the the registry is certainly not just for pediatrics; it's pediatrics and adults, and it's run by a whole team of people, both peds and adults. But we managed to get two pediatric gastroenterologists, clinician scientists, just like me, on the line. Well, and I, I would add that um, there are a lot fewer pediatric gastroenterologists in the world than there are adult gastroenterologists, but the impact that they have in the IBD community and in the research community has been phenomenal. Per capita, you guys are amazing. Thank you. Um, so, um, just to start um, with my weekly um, overview, and I just want to always start by thanking uh, Fox uh, Underwood, uh, Joseph Windsor, and Stephanie Cowher, the members of my, of my research team who um, have worked towards uh, analyzing uh, data every week and preparing these amazing slides that I can now display with you. And, and if you remember, we started this back on March 19th and I one of the first slides I shared with you was a slide from John Hopkins University. And again, remember if you have a QR code, you can see 
um, the website here by um, clicking your iPhone to it, or the link is right here as well. Um, and if you remember the, the very first uh, webinar we did on March 19th, there were 230,000 confirmed cases of um, COVID-19 uh, in the world. Um, there were about 84,000 people who had recovered, there were 9,000 people who had died, and 160 countries had reported. Um, by our second uh, webinar on March 26, half a million people. Um, and if you notice these yellow line, we're actually running out of space as we're getting into week six. Um, and so we had to skip a week, but you can see by April 9th, 1.5 million. April 16th, uh, 2.1 million people. Uh, and today, as of 10.30 this morning, 2.6 million people have been tested positive uh, for COVID um, around the world in over um, in 185 countries, and unfortunately, 186,000 people have died from, from COVID. Um, over the past six weeks, we've been able to, to generate uh, a lot of data from, from countries. Sorry, I'm just... Uh, um, and we've been able to create actually this really interesting map. And, and what this map is going to show you is the 32 countries around the world that have now reported more than 10,000 cases. So these are kind of the countries that have been kind of the hardest hit um, with COVID. Um, and what you're going to first see are countries um, that reported um, le uh, less than 10,000 cases. You're going to always stay in, in gray. The first you're going to see outlines of countries that are in green, and they have 10 to 20,000 cases reported. Yellow is 20 to 200 to 300,000 cases, and the one country that's reported over 300,000 cases, the U.S., you'll see here in a second um, light up. And then what we've done is we've standardized these cases relative to the population size. So how many cases per 100,000 people living, recognizing that larger countries are going to report larger cases. And, and that you're going to see now as countries that are shaded green, like um, Russia and India and China, um, Brazil, Mexico, these are all countries that have had about one to 50 cases per 100,000 people living in, in their country. The countries that are shaded in yellow have 50 to 200 cases per 100,000. And this is where we see Canada at about 110 cases per 100,000. So we're right in the middle of heavily affected countries related to COVID. But the countries in red are the hardest hit countries in the world. And we've actually ranked them from uh, one to 10. And these are all countries that have had more than 200 cases per 100,000 people living in their populations. You can see the country that's been hardest hit in this context has been Spain with 455 cases per 100,000, over four times the impact that we see in Canada. You can see Belgium here, you can see Italy is number five, the US is six at 254 cases per 100,000. Um, the UK at 200 cases per 100,000, double the, the rate that we see in Canada. And I did include uh, Singapore, which is close to 200 uh, per 100,000. The reason being is that they initially were doing really well, and then they've had kind of an, a, a recent outbreak again that's increased the number of cases there. What about Canada specifically? So if you remember back on March 19th, um, we had 780 cases uh, across the country, um, and 10 individuals had died. Um, by March 26, the cases went up to 300, uh, sorry, 3,400 cases. On April 8th, there was nearly 20,000 Canadians who were positive for COVID. By April 16th, we had nearly 30,000 people last week when we did this webinar. Uh, and today, as of 11 o'clock this morning, uh, over 40,000 Canadians have tested positive for COVID. Um, in the last six days, there's been 10,000 um, new cases. 14,000 Canadians have recovered. That represents a third of the people who have tested positive. But unfortunately, um, over 2,000 Canadians have died from, from COVID. When we look at this from a province perspective, and, um, and this is, uh, you can look here at each one of your provinces to see where the 40,000 cases have been distributed. If you uh, follow along here, you can see across the time with dates here, here on March 11th is when the WHO declared um, COVID a pandemic. You can start to see the cases starting to escalate across the country, looking at all the different um, provinces. And um, you can see here um, uh, in April, we're seeing huge spike in cases uh, in virtually um, all, all the provinces across the country. Uh, the hardest hit um, province so far has been Quebec with over 20,000 cases, over half of all the cases in Canada coming from from Quebec. Um, when we also standardize the provincial data against 
the population size of each of the provinces. So looking at cases per 100,000 people living in a province, um, we see that Quebec remains the hardest hit province in our country at 247 cases per 100,000 people living in Quebec. And if you remember that global map I showed you, I highlighted the 10 hardest hit countries in the world were all countries that reported greater than 200 cases per 100,000. So Quebec now represents, just in that province, a country uh, represents data similar to the 10 hardest hit countries. And I think all of us across the country need to do everything we can to support everyone living in Quebec who, who are suffering right now through, through this COVID pandemic. If you look at some of the other provinces, the um, Manitoba Saskatchewan still remains to have low, low rates, same with British Columbia. Here in Alberta, our rates are closer to um, 77 per 100,000 people, um, similar to what we're seeing um, in Ontario and, and Nova Scotia. Again, if you're tracking um, the 2,000 Canadians who have uh, died from COVID, you can see where in the province this was happening. And again, remember outcomes like hospitalizations and death are going to lag a few weeks from cases reported. So we're, we're not gonna see them climb as quickly as we see the, the cases. But now as we get in closer to April, you can see um, where we're having the, the most um, uh, bad outcomes and really Quebec and Ontario being the, the two hardest hit provinces for, for deaths. Last week, I showed you an, an interesting figure that looked at the um, average um, cause of death per day in the U.S. using data from the CDC. Today we kind of flipped it up and we, instead of looking at daily ca cause of death, we want to look at it over a course of a week. So this is a weekly average of death in the United States, deaths, and this is reported as deaths per million people. Um, and you can see here that there, um, we have data here for the 2017-2018 flu and also car crashes. You can see on a week-to-week -week basis um, how many people um, per million um, died from these events. Now let's look at what's happened to COVID uh, in the last month, uh, again, initially starting off as a low rate. And we're going to put in a few other comparisons. So, for example, if you look at the 1957-58 um, uh, influenza plus pneumonia, as well as if you include uh, uh, deaths from pneumonia and influenza. You can see that these cases are high, but COVID has now surpassed it. And then if you look at the most common cause of death in the U.S. on a week-to-week on a -week basis, it's heart disease and cancer. And already we're seeing COVID surpass that as the most um, common cause that somebody has passed away in the last um, few months on a week-to-week -week basis. What, how is our, our data in... Um, Canada, I apologize, there is a, um, a reference here that, that cites the source of this data, which is Statistics Canada. Um, and so if you look at data from Canada and compare it to that of the U.S., we are actually doing a lot better. And week by week, we continue to update this data. This is data from April 22nd. We can see that 82% of Canadians who have tested positive have had relatively mild symptoms and been able to manage and recover at home. 11% of Canadians have been hospitalized. 3% have ended up in the ICU. Uh, and the case fatality rates, the number of people who have died relative to all the people who have tested COVID positive across Canada is 4%. Stratifying that by age, uh, we can see that children and adolescents continue to do very well with this disease. If you're under the age of 20, 98% uh, of those individuals who have tested positive, those, those children um, have done well and have recovered at home, only 2% uh, in hospital, less than 1% in an ICU, uh, and, and no deaths. And this data in Canada is consistent with what we're seeing in children across the world. Um, what about um, adults? So if you're at age between 20 and 59 years old, Canadians still do well, 91% of them are, are in are recovering at home, 7% in hospital, 2% ICU, and less than 1% have died. And this is important because if you look at other countries in the Western world, including the United States, this group has had higher morbidity and a little bit higher mortality. So in Canada, we are doing well relative to our adult population. But again, the hardest hit age group is our elderly population. We can see here that um, while two thirds of them recover at home, 19% require hospitalization, 5% end up in the ICU, and the case fatality rate among elderly is 9%. So again, just highlighting why we're protecting our older population, um, shielding them from, from this disease, because they are the ones who are most susceptible. And again, I always encourage people to read this article from the Washington Post, because I think it really explains the power of physical distancing and what happens if you are that stationary dot. Um, you know from, probably heard a few of my um, talks in the past, um, that if 
we were to have done nothing, if we would have just let um, um, the um, everyone go out and become infected, uh, this simulation, if it, if it works, oh, it jumped away, so it may not work. Um, but um, uh, essentially, um, what what these um, simulations show that if you um, if we didn't have any physical distancing, um, we would have had um, uh, an overwhelmed healthcare system with a number of people who have, would have been uh, sick from this disease, overwhelming our ability to, oh, now it's uh, automatically working, um, uh, to um, uh, overwhelming our, our healthcare system. And compare that to this model here, where if you're staying at home, you're the stationary dot, um, uh, we're preventing infections and flattening the curve. Um, the reason that that's important is it's bought time. It's bought time for healthcare systems to um, prepare to increase acute care capacity, uh, to increase ICU beds. It's given us time to have a better understanding of this disease. And this is particularly relevant to the presentation we have today because this time that we've bought has allowed individuals like Dr. Brenner and Dr. Kappelman and all the team that's been involved with the Secure IBD Registry to build out this registry and to start to track patients with IBD so we can start to study and learn. So while you're at home protecting yourself from COVID, so there are people that are, are being exposed to this virus who have IBD, and we can learn from that and start to give you better information. And our understanding of this virus, its impact, its implications are going to be so much stronger um, in the weeks and months to come. So the longer that you can be the stationary dot, the better the advice that we're going to give to you. And you'll be able to see that today um, when we transition to um, hearing from Dr. Brenner and Dr. Kappelman. So at this point, I will also now transition to Eric, who I think is going to um, spend some time showing you our, our new updated website um, that the COVID IBD task force has worked with Crohn's Disease Colitis Canada. Um, so I think we're transferring um, Eric's screen over to his computer. Yeah, we are, and I guess my webcam as well. So just make sure that you guys are able to see my screen. You are, sorry, wrong screen. I'll pull it up. Okay. So, I mean, I think that there's good news here that uh, we have not made any changes to the recommendations on the Crohn's and Colitis Canada website uh, guidance for people with IBD uh, with regards to COVID. So this week, the task force met and felt that there was no new information that we needed to share with you as uh, patients to say that um, anything has changed. And the reason that's good news is because as you'll hear from Michael and Erica, the information that we're getting about IBD patients from the Secure IBD Registry and other studies uh, really are reinforcing that the recommendations that we made in the past few weeks uh, are based in reality, that, that we, you know, we're not learning anything new or disastrous that is happening with IBD patients. And you'll hear about the recommendations that the, or the, the, the knowledge that the Secure IBD Registry has developed and how that's going to be consistent with the recommendations that we've made so far. But what we did spend time this week on is actually making the website a little bit more user-friendly and a little bit more digestible. Uh, you know, it got to the point where we had a lot of information on that, that original COVID-19 website, but I want to show you the, the revamp. So this is, if you go to the Crohn's and Colitis Canada website and you click on the COVID-19 section, you'll see firstly that there are uh, specific areas and, and icons that you can click on to get pieces of information throughout. So I want to focus firstly on the guidance document. Um, and this contains all the information that you needed to know about how to prevent and how to uh, ensure your safety if you're living with IBD. Um, for example, there's travel information about travel and distancing and what that means. And embedded in each part of the website are segments of the webinars that we've done. Uh, thank you to Joey Windsor who, with Gill's group who uh, edited the video and cut it down to bite-sized packages. So if we made a recommendation, for example, about travel, that video, even if it was a few weeks old, is posted in that section to make it very easy to see and very easy to understand. Um, the pyramid that you may remember me post, uh, presenting about a few weeks ago, uh, the risk pyramid is under this section here, are you at risk? If you click about learn more, the pyramid is still here and the recommendations have not changed. So deciding whether you're in a low risk group, a medium risk group and a high risk group, all of that is the same. And you can see the video here from when I originally presented it, what all of that means is there for you to digest on YouTube as well. Um, the other thing worth uh, showing you, 
if I can get my browser to go backwards, ah, there we go. So back to the main page is that all the webinars are archived here on the website. So if you click on webinars, uh, you'll see who the speakers are. You can register for this week's webinar right here. And then you can subscribe to the Crohn's and Colitis Canada YouTube channel and get up to date on YouTube directly if you want to over here. Uh, and then past webinar videos are all archived here. So if you wanted to watch last week's webinar, the webinar is there right embedded on the YouTube, it ha on, you uh, on the website from YouTube. And it has you know a biography of all the speakers and everything like that. So it, very easy to access all the webinars from that main page. And then finally, what I wanted to show you is this get answers section. So many of you have asked questions and a lot of the questions come up repeatedly and we've tried to, um, to show the, uh, the, the most common answers or, or talk about the most common answers at the webinars whenever we can. And we did have one open Q&A session where we were able to answer questions, but a lot of your questions may not have been answered. Uh, and so the most frequently asked questions are on this website under get answers. And so for example, if you see at the bottom here, uh, I can't go to an, a clinic to receive my infusion. Is it possible to administer my own injection of the biologic so that I don't have to visit a clinic? And the answer is there that some clinics and patient support programs are now offering virtual training on how to self-inject at home. And you can contact your patient support program coordinator or your healthcare provider to try to uh, learn more about that. So all of these questions are answered there. I wanted to also bring your attention that on this purple bar here, there's a, a you know a navigation pane as well so you can go to wherever you want directly rather than going back to the main page uh, and there is also if i go back up there's a need help section here we go uh, where you can actually submit your questions and we can try to answer them on a future webinar or have one of the uh, the experts answer it for you as well so if you have questions and you couldn't find it in the frequently asked questions please submit it there uh, and then finally, I want to highlight again this large purple box uh, donation. So I'm going to highlight it now rather than at the end. I usually say this at the end, but as you all know, if you've heard previous webinars, uh, we're in very difficult financial times and charities in particular are, are going through very difficult times. Crohn's and Colitis Canada, unfortunately, is no different than other health charities in struggling because they've had to cancel all the in-person funding fundraising events uh, and other events that may have brought in funds so to help support research as well as to help support uh, educational initiatives like this, like the webinars and the website and all the advocacy work that Crohn's and Colitis Canada does. So if you appreciate this webinar and if you appreciate Crohn's and Colitis Canada, I would urge you to click on donate, the big purple donate button, which is on most of the pages. That'll bring you to the Crohn's and Colitis Canada donation uh, area. Um, and in addition, I hope to show you the Gutsy Walk in particular, if you the Gutsy Walk is really the number one support structure for the grants to, to fund research at Crohn's and Colitis Canada, which uh, is the number one non-government research funder for Crohn's and Colitis in Canada, uh, and number two in the world, uh, second to second to the U.S. Um, I want to emphasize that we actually have a team, Gil and Eric's COVID IBD webinar. So if you want to show support for the webinar, please click on that team, Gil and Eric's COVID IBD webinar. It's easy to search for, just search for COVID. And you'll see that um, you can donate directly to the team here in the green button. So uh, we would appreciate all the support. And really, I think Crohn's and Colitis Canada needs all the help it can get at this point in time. Uh, we work mostly by volunteers, but a lot of these events do cost some money. So we certainly appreciate any help that you can give us. Thank you very much. And with that, I think that we will move on to what you've all been waiting for, and that's the presentation uh, and the question and answer session about the uh, Secure IBD website and the, the registry. So I want to introduce our two guests today. Uh, as I mentioned, they're both pediatric gastroenterologists and both from the United States. Uh, we'll introduce first Dr. Michael Kappelman, who is a pediatric gastroenterologist and health services researcher with a focus on IBD. He's a professor of pediatrics and epidemiology at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, UNC Chapel Hill. In addition to clinical care, he's actively engaged in clinical and comparative effectiveness research that uses real world data to evaluate the risks and benefits of treatments used every day in clinical practice. 
His work also focuses on uh, the use of quality improvement strategies to incorporate new knowledge into practice and patient care. He's been funded by a variety of sources like the National Institutes of Health, the NIH, CDC, PCORI, AHRQ, and uh, not-for-profit agencies and industry as well. Uh, so thank you, Michael, for joining us. And I'd also like to introduce Erica Brenner. Dr. Brenner is a pediatric gastroenterology fellow, which means she's still in training technically, although I think she's already contributed more than most of us have in 10 years of practice to the knowledge of people with IBD. Uh, she's a fellow also at UNC Chapel Hill and pursuing a master's of science in clinical research. She's uh, going to join the UNC GI Epidemiology T32 training program, which is a training grant that's funded by the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, that provides protected time to postdoctoral fellows. Um, she aspires to career in clinical epidemiology and outcomes, of course, while treating children with IBD. So thank you as well, Erica, for joining us. And I think they are going to start with a bit of a presentation, and then we'll move on to some questions and answers after that. And this week, we're having a little technical difficulties, but we'll work through them. Are you able to advance the slide, Erica? There we All go. Right. It's a little bit delayed, <laughs> yes, so, but you know, perfect. Uh, Eric and Gil, thank you so much for having us. It is truly an honor. Um, so I, uh, tonight we're gonna talk about the secure IBD database or the surveillance epidemiology of coronavirus under research exclusion. And this project was developed by myself and Mike Kappelman at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in collaboration with Jean-Frederick Colombell and Ryan Angaro at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York. So the purpose of this database is to rapidly define the impact of coronavirus on patients with IBD and evaluate how factors such as age, comorbidities or medical conditions and IBD treatments affect coronavirus outcomes. And we are committed to openly sharing the findings with the IBD community, including the number of reported cases and outcomes and data broken down by geographic region, IBD treatment and various other factors. Really, this project is made up of three different components. There's the database itself, our website, and then finally, our communication and dissemination strategy. And I'll talk about all three tonight. So first, our database is con composed of web-based surveys filled out by IBD healthcare providers all around the world. And each survey, and you can see an example on the right side of the slide, collects data on um, patient location, demographics, IBD characteristics, comorbidities, and coronavirus outcomes. All of this data is collected to a secure encrypted server at the University of North Carolina, and all of the data is de-identified in accordance with HIPAA safe harbor standards. So IBD providers, if they take care of a patient who contracts coronavirus, are able to fill out this survey and provide us with more information. Our website, www.covidibd.org, um, is really the heart of our project. So when you first go to the website, you encounter our landing page, and that provides more information about the purpose of the project, and you can easily access frequently asked questions. This is also where healthcare providers can access the database and can report a case. This unique uh, web-based format also facilitates the rapid sharing of data. So three times per week, we are updating the website with all of our preliminary data and all of our findings so far. Um, also on our website, there are links to both patient and provider resources. And here we acknowledge many of our par partnering organizations. 
So we are excited to engage with the International Pediatric and Adult IBD Communications and our community because really this project, the success of this project really relies on broad worldwide participation. Truly, we are all in this together. So we have been utilizing multiple platforms to get the word out there. And that includes uh, the many partnering organizations who have worked with us, also social media platforms such as Twitter and Facebook, and patient awareness organizations all over the world. So why is this registry important for patients? Well, right now, there is only limited information on the effect of coronavirus on patients with inflammatory bowel disease, and particularly on individuals who are on different medicines that can suppress the immune system. So our hope is that this registry will help to answer these important questions about coronavirus risk for patients with IBD. And the online format allows us to rapidly and freely share data with the public, with both providers and with patients. So, so far, the uh, participation from the worldwide IBD community has been nothing short of extraordinary. As of today, six, over 69,000 individual users have accessed the website from 145 different countries. The world map, um, all of the areas covered in blue show the locations where individuals have accessed our website. I'll now turn it over to Mike to share some of our preliminary results. Perfect. And as I'm getting started, if someone could give me a signal that the audio is working okay? I can hear you, Mike. Okay. Perfect. Um, a couple of introductory comments. First is I really would like to thank Friends and Colitis Canada for not only having us uh, on the program tonight, uh, but for also partnering with us in the Secure IBD program um, and helping to get the word out there. It's only by partnering with organizations like yours over the globe that, uh, that we're able to ensure the success of this project. And I'd also like to thank Gil and Eric uh, for personally inviting us to be here this evening. Um, I've been friends with Gil and Eric for the last 15 years, which is hard to believe. And finally, I know that uh, this organization is as patient-centered and uh, spun off of, of patient motivation. Um, Secure IBD is also um, spun off of patient motivation, and it was on March 5th that I got a text from the parent of one of my patients saying, Dr. Kappelman, what are you and your team doing to study COVID in IBD patients? And I had absolutely no answer to that question on March 5th when I got the text. Um, but it was only about uh, 12 hours later when I woke up at three in the morning and realized, gosh, we really do need to study this. We really do need to study it quickly. And the only way to do that is to put together a worldwide uh, collaborative project that includes both pediatric and adult IBD um, and where the entire world can work together to solve this problem um, as, as quickly as possible. Uh, so with that in mind, I'm uh, really happy to share our preliminary data. Uh, these are data that are hot off the press as of yesterday. Um, it's quite astonishing that we have had over 700 reported cases of COVID amongst IBD patients, um, and perhaps even more astonishing that reports have come from a total of 38 different countries. The median age of reported cases is 41 years. 53% of cases reported have occurred in males. Um, and at the bottom of the slide here is a breakdown of the inflammatory bowel disease activity at the time that uh, COVID was, uh, was developed. Um, close to 60% of patients were in remission. In other words, their IBD was quiescent and uh, there were no active 
symptoms, 18% had mild IBD, 14% moderate to severe IBD, and 6% uh, of reported cases were unknown. Let me see if I can advance my slide. Hmm. So this is a map that uh, Gil Kaplan and his group produced for us, uh, showing uh, graphically the countries who have reported cases. Um, and I'm gonna actually use this as a example. Um, probably the most amazing thing about this project is that, and actually about the entire COVID epidemic or pandemic, um, is that it really has restored my faith in humanity. Um, people have come out of the woodworks um, approaching us with offers to help. What can I do to help? How can I help analyze the data? Is there anything that I can do to help get the word out there? Um, and Gil and his group came to us and said, hey, we've looked at the data that you all have been reporting online um, in, uh, in your registry, and we've put together a interactive map for you, uh, modeled after the map that uh, the Gill had shown earlier and that the Johns Hopkins group is using to show the worldwide spread of, of COVID. Um, and after that uh, gift from, from Gills, we've included uh, him and his team as a partner um, in helping us with data visualization. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later today. Uh, this next slide here, if I'm able to advance, um, is another representation of the number of cases by country. And what we're seeing in our case reports roughly mirrors uh, the data that uh, the Gill had shown earlier this evening in terms of the um, worldwide impact of COVID-19 um, and how uh, there's about 10 countries or so who have really been hit hard. And we're seeing exactly the same thing in, in our data. Let me see if I can. Um, and so this is our curve of cases reported over time. The orange at the top are um, uh, cases reported in um, Crohn's disease patients, and the yellow at the bottom are cases reported in ulcerative colitis patients. Um, and uh, unfortunately, it's been a uh, linear, if not uh, parabolic, increase over the last several weeks. Uh, since the uh, the beginning of uh, really the beginning of time on uh, on March 13th, so I'm going to get into some of our our data as well. This uh, this summary slide here is busy, so I'm going to take a little bit of time and orient you. Um, at the very top of the slide here is our overall population of 704 reported cases. 67% um, of reported cases amongst IBD patients have been relatively mild and have been managed as a outpatient only. Um, roughly a third of um, cases of COVID have required hospitalization. And the death rate amongst our reported cases is 4%. So that's roughly along the same lines of uh, what Dr. Kaplan showed um, on the Canadian data, and really roughly um, along the same lines of uh, what we've seen worldwide with COVID. So I think um, the most important message that, uh, that we've learned already is that when COVID happens in IBD patients, yes, for sure, it's scary, um, but it is a lot better than many of us would have predicted in early March. Um, I think the other take home point um, is like with the general population, um, the severe outcomes of COVID and particularly death uh, seems to increase with increasing age. Um, so you can see at the bottom here, um, we've had no deaths reported in um, not only pediatric patients, but patients less than 30 years of age. Um, conversely, for patients with inflammatory bowel disease who develop COVID um, that are reported to our registry, um, in the older age group, the death rate is as high as 33%. And about three quarters of the deaths reported in our registry have occurred in patients greater than um, 60 years of age. 
So it seems like age is the major driver of uh, COVID-related severity amongst IBD patients, much the same as it is in patients in the general population. In addition to age, another major driver of COVID outcomes are non-IBD comorbidities, um, other health conditions beyond the inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, you can see here again in patients with um, IBD only and no other comorbidities, uh, the death rate is about 1%. And as the number of comorbid or other health conditions increases, uh, the, uh, the rate of death uh, in IBD patients also increases. The million dollar question, of course, is how do medications affect the outcomes of COVID? Um, and we do have a lot of data that is posted on our website, um, but rather than showing you numbers, what I thought I would do on this slide is provide some high level trends. Um, I do wanna stress that it is still too early to make strong conclusions um, and as I mentioned in the prior slide, there are a number of other um, things that are super important to account for that impact coronavirus outcomes beyond medicines that uh, the patients are taking. Um, one clear trend that we've seen is that more severe coronavirus outcomes are associated with the use of oral steroids such as prednisone or prednisolone. Um, and you know, all of the ways that we're able to model the data um, do, do indicate that, uh, that there's a high, that, that the patients taking prednisone or prednisolone are a higher risk group. That doesn't mean the patient should stop prednisone or prednisolone cold turkey. Um, I really don't want, uh, don't want to convey that at all. Um, but I think as we're going through the weeks and months ahead, um, it will be important for patients and their physicians to figure out ways to manage inflammatory bowel disease, keep the disease in remission that use medications that are steroid or prednisone sparing. Um, about 40% of the reported cases uh, were being treated with TNF antagonist medications. And so these are medications like infliximab, um, or which is Remicade or the biosimilars, um, adalimumab or Humira, and there are a couple of other medications in that uh, TNF antagonist class. Um, and I think I think we can draw some reassurance that this class of medications does not appear to be associated with more severe coronavirus outcomes. And so for patients who are taking um, anti-TNF medications, and probably a lot of the other classes of, of biologics, there really doesn't seem to be a early uh, safety signal associated with these medications. Again, I think that overall this is, is reassuring. Um, we do need more data and a bit more time before we can detect any um, medium or strong trends uh, for other classes of medications. One of the things that our group is most proud of is that the Secure IBD Registry has served as a blueprint for a number of other conditions, um, both in the space of GI as well as in the space of other immune-mediated conditions. Um, and very early on, um, we you know, really worked hard to um, allow other groups to have a uh, expedited startup so that they could collect similar data um, to us and answer some similar pressing questions in other patient populations. And so we've worked with um, a team that is studying cirrhosis and liver transplant, a team that is studying celiac disease, several teams that are studying psoriasis and rheumatologic conditions, including juvenile idiopathic arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, and lupus. Um, and more recently, we've worked with some hematologic organizations studying sickle cell disease um, and bone cancers like leukemia, lymphoma, and multiple myeloma. And we really look forward to collaborating with uh, a lot of the groups um, like in dermatology and rheumatology that use a lot of the same medicines 
that we use to treat inflammatory bowel disease uh, so that we can pool data together um, and learn even faster as a collaborative effort. And so I know that many of you on the call are patients um, or caregivers, and um, we've received a lot of questions from the patient community. What can we do to help? Um, so first and foremost, if you think you have signs or symptoms of coronavirus, um, please call your IBD provider. Um, call them not only to ask for advice um, as to what to do um, in the midst of, of this illness, but please encourage your provider to report um, cases of coronavirus to the Secure IBD Registry. Again, that website is www.covidibd.org. And if you are a patient yourself, uh, you can participate in the IBD Partners um, Network. The IBD Partners Network has been um, established by the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation in the United States, but is a worldwide uh, direct to patient registry. Um, the website for that is www.ibdpartners.org, and patients can complete um, surveys about inflammatory bowel disease, uh, provide uh, patient reported outcomes, and um, other really important data that only patients can provide about the impact of IBD on health and life. And over the next week or so, we will be launching a special module on coronavirus. Uh, where patients will enter a sub-study and receive surveys every two weeks about the symptoms of coronavirus, um, as well as about how the entire world has changed over the last month. Um, medicine has changed. Um, the practice of telehealth has changed. Um, the physical distancing that Gil had mentioned has really um, changed life for, for so many of us. And uh, this patient experience survey will help to, uh, to capture the unique aspect of these changes on the lives of patients with inflammatory bowel disease. And on my last slide, I really would like to acknowledge all of our partners who have been so instrumental in making this uh, project work, um, including the Crohn's and Colitis uh, Canada, um, but also several other organizations, both in North America as well as internationally. And we particularly like, like to like the funders of this project, including the Helmsley Charitable Trust, our clinical uh, science uh, network at uh, the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, um, and a number of pharmaceutical uh, partners who are listed on our project website. So thanks, and we're happy to, uh, to join the panel and uh, take any questions. Mike and Erica, thank you so much. That was a brilliant presentation. And thank you for starting this registry and spending this last half hour um, telling our patients. And, you, and you, I think you did it in such a wonderful way that was really clear and eloquent. Whether you're a physician like me or if you're a patient with IBD, it was really understandable. And, and a lot of what you said really resonated with me. I remember on March 11th, the WHO announcing this as a global pandemic and realizing whoa, the world is going to change. Um, and, and that would let us actually to strike Crohn's and Colitis Canada's uh, national COVID and IBD task force that Eric and I co-chair with um, gastroenterologist scientists um, across the country. Um, and when we first started thinking about the problems that we were going to be facing um, for our patients, we had no data. We, everything that we were doing was all based on extrapolation. Most of the COVID cases were coming from Asia where the rates of IBD were very low. And so there wasn't any kind of clues for us to, to go for. But at the same time, we had to make recommendations and we extrapolated and we in, in nationally got together and then we were, many of us were part of international groups that spoke. Um, and we set a series of recommendations um, that were based on ex extrapolations. And I'll give you one example, and I think it was a, a, somebody in the audience asked, you know, why is prednisone makes things serious and puts you at a higher risk group? Well, what happened was in Asia, there was a group that tried to treat people who were very sick with COVID with prednisone as a treatment because we saw that in their lungs, people who developed the viral pneumonia, many of them were succumbing to a hyperinflammatory response in their lungs, less so than the virus actually attacking the lung. But when they tried with, with prednisone, 
uh, those patients got got worse compared to those that they didn't give prednisone. And that was one that data again wasn't studied in IBD, but it led us to say that if you're on prednisone, you're likely going to be um, considered a high risk group. Uh, and now you know weeks later. You know, you develop this registry and you're now starting to give us some preliminary, preliminary snapshots of 700 patients who have IBD uh, and, and are COVID positive. And some of the, the guidance that we've given, and I think Eric, you'd mentioned this uh, during your, your talk on, on reviewing the, the recommendations, you know, it's, it's, it is reassuring that what we were saying is reflected in, in the data. Um, so I, I just wanted to start by kind of sharing that with the audience. Uh, and again, thank you for your, your great presentation. Yeah, no, thank you very much, Mike and Erica. I really appreciate it as well. And maybe I'll start us off with a question. Uh, you mentioned how the idea came up through through the story of uh, a patient's parent calling you and saying, "What are you going to do about this?" Which is a fantastic way to get research started. It it happens really very often that the ideas come from our interaction with patients, but this is particularly because you got it together so quickly. But uh, I'm fascinated by the fact that you were collaborating with. Uh, gastroenterologists in New York, in New York City, at, uh, at the Icon School of Medicine, Mount Sinai. Uh, what was that like, sort of starting that collaboration and then watching as New York City became the epicenter of COVID-19 in the world, really? I'm happy to, uh, to start off, uh, Eric, if you don't mind. Um, you know, again, the COVID thing has really struck me as um, something that brings out the best in everyone. And, you know, it, it, it was one of these situations where everyone wanted to work together, to learn together, to collaborate, um, rather than rather than sort of uh, rush and, and do it yourself. Um, you know, we had, uh, had started the planning of this. I had discussed this with a friend Simultaneously, the Mount Sinai group, because they were in the, in the epicenter of all of this, uh, had started doing some planning and preliminary discussions. They spoke to uh, to the same friend. Uh, that person put us together. Um, right around the same time, a international organization, the International Organization for the Study of Inflammatory Bowel Disease, was also talking about how can we make this a, a global worldwide epic. Uh, a, a global worldwide collaboration and everything just came together literally in about an hour. Um, yes, let's all work together. Um, let's have our team join forces with the Mount Sinai team. Um, let's harness um, international collaboration rather than having every, uh, every country or every hospital do its own thing. Let's have one registry and let's make sure that we can, uh, can do this uh, as quickly and as efficiently as possible. And I understand you're also collaborating with uh, another, there's a pediatric registry that's going on as well in Europe, right, out run by Dan Turner. You're collaborating a little bit with him as well? Absolutely. So again, it was the exact same thing where, um, you know, Dr. Turner reached out to me, uh, you know, within within a couple of hours and said, listen, I've already got a, a multi-center group together in Europe. We've been collaborating on a number uh, of projects. We don't want to interfere um, with secure IBD. Um, let's sort of compare notes. Let's harmonize our data collection forms. Um, and in fact, every several weeks, uh, Dr. Turner and their group sends us a update of, of what they've learned in their reported cases. Um, we uh, we include them on our those cases, a summary of those cases on our website as well, um, so that the entire world can uh, can see what has been reported there as well. And in our very first manuscript that we submitted for publication, we pulled together. Um, the uh, six reported cases in that uh, European pediatric group with the several hundred cases in secure IBD. So again, you know, it really has been a, a worldwide, highly collaborative effort. And I think that's right. Oh, sorry, I was just going to say, Erica, you're a pediatric GI fellow. Um, so, I mean, you've had your years and years of training, but I'm just kind of curious, how did you get involved? And, you know, how is this as being a trainee, being involved in such an international registry? What's that been like? Yeah, so uh, Mike must have gotten woken up at three in the morning on a Wednesday because I very distinctly remember that he reached out to me on a Thursday with a quote unquote game changer idea, something that would actually allow us to make a difference in what has been a pretty tough time. Um, so as soon as he came and sat down at my office and told me about it, I was really excited and i think mike said i feel like we're living in dog years because it has 
truly been lightning speed from Mike sitting down talking to me about this idea and us brainstorming and then collaborating with Brian and John Frederick in New York City and then actually getting this website and this database off the ground. It's all happened very rapidly and it has been such a steep learning curve for me. It's been truly amazing and um, the very smart people that I have worked with and learned from over the past month has just really been incredible for, for me. So I, I am honored to, to not feel useless during this time, to feel like I'm making a difference and able to help my patients. And I am certainly learning a lot along the way. And I think the message that we're hoping to send to the audience and that you've sent to the audience is a positive one, right? That people really are stepping up and working together and doing everything that they can to help help people, uh, help patients with IBD, and then help even people who don't have IBD prevent getting COVID. Uh, and scientists around the world, clinicians around the world, physicians, nurses are all working together to try to to beat this. Sometimes we don't always get that message if we watch the news on a regular basis. We hear about people working against each other. That's not the reality in the medical world or the science world right now, I think. Yeah, that's a, an excellent point. Um, and, and Mike, you'd mentioned earlier that we know, we've know we known each other, we're friends, we've been collaborators for 15 years. And during these past 15 years, I, I can honestly tell the audience that you are one of the leading researchers in the field of IBD and in particularly in developing registries and databases like that. So when I saw this database come to fruition and I saw kind of your name on the top of that, it was not surprising uh, to see that. And I think it's, it would be a unique opportunity if you wanted to share with us some of the challenges you've had in putting together databases and the experience that you've had in the past to kind of get you to this point where you could put together an international registry in a few hours. Yeah, so this this was a few days. It wasn't quite a few a few <laughs> hours. Um, and you know, I think like with any um, large scale project, the the barriers are never technical, um, right? These days, the barriers are never technical. Um, you know, there's a, a a technical solution for for anything that, that by and large is is off the the shelf. Um, right? What are the hard things that uh, that need to to be accomplished? To, to ensure the success of a project, it's building consensus. Um, and, and in this case, uh, it was easy because everyone wanted to do the right thing so that we could learn as quickly as possible. It was um, building collaboration and partnership. And we had a jump start um, with the International Organization for the Study of IBD, which um, Gil is a member of. Um, and after that, you know, in every continent and, um, you know, probably now over 50 countries, the local and regional IBD societies, both patient societies as well as professional societies quickly said, yes, you know, we want to back the project. We want to help um, promote the project. We want to uh, um, ensure the success of the project. Um, you know, it, it, it was always important to build trust. Um, within the community, right? The only way that people are going to feel comfortable reporting cases is if they trust us. Um, so part of that started with the name Secure IBD. Um, while it stands for Surveillance Epidemiology of Coronavirus Under Research Exclusion, we really did want to have the word secure in it uh, because it's, uh, it's part of that um, trust. And I think the other component of that is transparency. Um, we never intended to have this data go into a, a database or, or a black box um, to be hoarded by, uh, by our study group and, and wait for a paper to be published a year or two later. But from day one, um, our commitment was, how can we get the data up on our website um, as quickly as possible so the entire world can see what, uh, what we're seeing? And I think that, uh, that that has gone a long way to, to fostering um, collaboration. Um, communication as well. Um, we've worked on creating weekly newsletters. We've done as many of these patient programs as um, we possibly can. We've done as many of these professional programs as, as we possibly can to, to help get the, get the word out there. Um, and then finally, we wanted to make the barrier to entry as easy as possible for busy 
healthcare providers. And so we worked hard to design a case report form that didn't have all of the data that we'd like, but it had all of the data that we absolutely needed. And by getting rid of the things that we wanted but didn't need, um, we were able to keep it short enough that healthcare providers can report in about five minutes. Um, and the other thing that we uh, focused on was making sure that all of the data were de-identified um, to help ease the, the regulatory burden and, and make this uh, as easy as possible for um, local regulatory and, and ethical uh, organizations. Um, boy, we would have liked to have had identified data. Boy, we would have liked to have built a prospective study. All of that may come later, but in the, uh, you know, at the time our goal was let's get this launched in about five days. Um, and so we had to sacrifice a lot to, to focus on what the, uh, what the essentials were. And, and those were some tough decisions, but, but it's one that, that, that I think worked out. But again, none of the barriers are technical. All, all, all the IT stuff is easy. It's, it's the, uh, the interpersonal and team building and collaboration that, uh, that takes a lot of thought. And the one thing I just want to stress is the term de-identified. So for our audience, de-identified means that there's no identifiable information. A name doesn't go in there, a healthcare number, um, anything that you could potentially track yourself. So somebody on the audience may have had COVID and they have IBD and you might have potentially been reported into this database know that it's anonymous like we can't we don't know who the patients are things like that uh, and, and that's what allows us to kind of develop this international registry so I just want everyone to understand that to realize that 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 it's a safe and secure website if, if um, you by chance end up in the database yeah absolutely um, so let's talk a little bit about some of your results and and particularly uh, which medications might be associated with better, worse, or the same outcomes, that sort of thing. That's a lot of questions that we're getting from the audience right now. Um, uh, the two that keep coming up, so prednisone, if you one of you can comment on what's happening with prednisone and steroids and what you think about why it might be a high-risk drug. Uh, and secondly would be uh, the biologics. And the question that keeps coming up is about infliximab or Remicade, Renflexus, Inflectra. Um, and both, does that increase your risk of developing complications from COVID, which I think you you discussed a little bit earlier, Mike, but if you can repeat that. But also, I think people have heard rumors of biologics being tried to treat COVID. So is it possible that Remicade is uh, actually making things better? Erica, you want to start? Yeah, uh, so those are all great questions. Um, First, to tackle the steroid question. Uh, so we have seen, at least trend-wise, and again, these data are still preliminary, but we are seeing that individuals who are on steroids like prednisone are at a higher risk of having severe outcomes and at a higher risk of death from COVID. And, um, while we can't definitively say why that is the case, um, overall steroids are a pretty big gun and they sort of hit the immune system from multiple angles as compared to some of our other medicines like the biologic medicines like Remicade that is more specific to a certain part of the immune system. But the exact mechanisms or the way that that's working, I think there are a lot of smart people thinking about that question right now, but that's not something that we can definitively answer. Um, I'll add that the prednisone bit was not a surprise finding um, this is a story that, that we've seen before. Um, you know, no matter how you look at it with any type of infection ranging from um, pneumonias and other bacterial infections to viral infections uh, like uh, herpes zoster or shingles or influenza, um, steroids do appear to be a, a risk for, for more severe outcomes. And I think Gil mentioned uh, the second point in uh, in the beginning of, of the session today. Um, leaving IBD out of it, um, it was initially thought that treating patients with uh, significant lung involvement um, from COVID with prednisone would be a good thing to reduce the inflammation in the lungs, uh, but it turned out that, uh, that that didn't work either. Um, so I think from a general um, 
infectious and IBD risk, as well as the specific COVID related thing, um, prednisone does not seem to be helpful. Um, the second part of your question, Eric, was about the, the anti-TNF medications and the, and the Remicade. And, and that story, um, I think, might be a little bit uh, surprising. Um, at least from the data that, that we're seeing in this registry, um, it does not appear that um, anti-TNF increases the risk of more severe COVID outcomes at all. Um, and in fact, um, it may be that patients treated with anti-TNF have less of a risk of, of more severe COVID outcomes. Our data don't, don't yet point to a protective effect, if, if you will, uh, but certainly uh, many have speculated that blocking that anti-TNF mechanism and blocking that pro-inflammatory pathway um, may be protective um, against uh, severe outcomes in COVID not just in IBD patients, but the general population. There was a, a prominent uh, rheumatologist who wrote an opinion piece uh, in, a, in a journal a week or so ago, um, suggesting that we should probably be doing trials of anti-TNF type medications, not in IBD patients, but in general patients to prevent severe complications of the disease. I think that's a, a finding that needs um, more time and further teasing out, but uh, but I think was a um, a surprise and potentially a pleasant a pleasant one. Yeah, and, and I think to to state, I mean, definitively, we don't know right now, and there are no trials ongoing, as far as I'm aware, nothing that's been registered anyway that has is looking at anti TNF therapies like Remicade or Humira uh, in the treatment of COVID in people who don't have arthritis or IBD. Uh, there are trials going on for other biologics, so. Uh, particularly anti-IL-6, which is another cytokine or inflammatory chemical in the blood. They found that people who are, have more severe disease uh, with COVID have higher levels of IL-6 in their blood. And so they're now trying to see whether anti-IL-6 biologics to block IL-6 actually make things better. But for now, we don't really know much about anti-TNF. But at least we're, you know, I think so far the news that we're getting from your registry is good that, you know, things to be, seem not to be worse in people who are on uh, the anti-TNF biologics. And, and the one thing I just want to point out for the audience is the type of work that we're presenting what we call observational research, where we're observing what's happening. And the observations are, are kind of guideposts that helps us try to understand what's happening and to make decisions in real time that affect patients because we, we don't have the answers. The definitive way to study something if something works or doesn't work is a randomized control study where you randomize some people to get an intervention and some people to not get an intervention or something else happens. And then you follow them forward to see uh, does that intervention is superior and, and it, they're randomly assigned so it doesn't you know it's a flip of a coin whether you get it or don't get it and so where really observational data becomes powerful is to give us signals to then say you know what this would actually would be a valuable thing to study in a randomized control trial and, and that's where if you'll probably hear on the news there are countless randomized control studies testing so many different um, therapies because right now people are just desperate to try to find something to treat or to prevent. Um, and so I, I think the, one of the exciting things coming from this registry, this observational research, is that maybe we'll see some signals to help define and develop, deliver some randomized control studies for people who are suffer, suffering from COVID. Um, and on that note, one of the things I just wanted to ask uh, Mike and Erica is just, are there any cautions or limitations when, um, you know, little, uh, later on we're gonna be showing the, the map and the interactive map and patients can go in and look at it. And I just wanted to get a sense from you, are there any cautions, limitations, any kind of warning signals that you should tell people who are looking at this data um, uh, in the context of how the study is designed and so on. Yeah, that's a great point, Gail. Um, and there are a couple of things that I'd like to emphasize. Uh, so first, we have asked healthcare providers to only report cases of confirmed coronavirus. And that means that their patient had to have actually taken a test and tested positive, not just had the symptoms that were consistent or suggestive of coronavirus. And that means that any findings that we get, we can be more confident that it is truly related to coronavirus and not something acting like coronavirus, like the flu or allergies or something else. But the downside of that is that there are many, many patients who may have had coronavirus who never got a test and therefore haven't been included in our registry. 
and there is the possibility that that then selects in our registry for the patients who may be sicker because it's more likely that the patients who get tested would have been the patients who presented with more severe symptoms and had to go to the hospital and therefore got the test. So our death rates and our rates of hospitalization and rates of people requiring a ventilator may be higher and actually I'm pretty sure would be higher than if we really had an if we were really able to study everyone with coronavirus and including those individuals who did not get tested. Yeah, I think it's a great point. And just for everyone to know that, so sometimes when you look at a, at a database like that, given the limitations that Erica has described, you might see that the numbers are, are overinflated, particularly they might look scarier than they probably really are if you were able to, to study this you know, broadly across the whole world. Um, uh, and, and, but having said that, um, what's key with this, these types of databases are having people who have bad outcomes and people who have good outcomes. Um, and having that spread allows you to start to explore whether there are certain factors that might lend somebody to have a bad outcome versus a good outcome, for example, being on a drug like prednisone versus being on a drug like Remicade. So it still allows us to do that type of, of research. Um, but just to recognize that when you look at the database, the numbers are probably overinflated relative to what's really happening out in, in the population. Erica and Mike, were you able to look at what happens to the IBD patients once they get COVID? Like, uh, do they flare? We know that other viruses can cause flare-ups of IBD. Is there any signal there that, that the IBD patients are flaring or, or you couldn't actually see that yet? So we have asked questions about GI symptoms that were new at the time of coronavirus, but we are not able to sort of divide out whether those GI symptoms are new and all related to the coronavirus itself, because uh, part of the reported symptoms of coronavirus include um, diarrhea and nausea for some individuals, or whether the coronavirus is somehow triggering a flare and it's more of the IBD itself. So it's a really good question that I think merits evaluation by future studies, but not something that we're gonna be able to answer right now. Perfect, thanks. So two, three pediatric gastroenterologists on the line, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask about children and teens. So, it, it, I mean, judging by your numbers, there how many children and teens were there under 20 in the group? There was about 35, 30? I think so. Somewhere, somewhere in that yeah. range. Our and numbers I, are changing so rapidly, but I think <laughs> 30s. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the outcome were... one less than age 20, and then another 146 between age 20 and 29. Okay. And the numbers were outstanding. It looked like for the less than 20, I think it was 3% needed to be hospitalized far lower than the older older patients, and Correct. nobody needed the ICU and nobody died. Thank goodness. Um, so how does that influence your and practice? And that can largely be extended up to about age 29 as well. Perfect. Um, how does that influence your practice? I know I have patients, you know, we've got patients with new diagnoses who are coming in and need therapy. Uh, I, I know, I mean, I'll answer my own question and then I'd love to hear your answer as well. I'm avoiding prednisone if I can. If I absolutely in, in any way can avoid prednisone, I am. I'm using either exclusive enteral nutrition, which is a therapy we use mostly in, in children, uh, sort of exclusive formula, formula feeds, or uh, I'm using, you know, methotrexate, imuran, a biologic to induce and maintain remission. And I'm telling people to stay on those medicines because it's a lot safer if you're in remission and doing well on an immunosuppressive medicine than if you need steroids or you need to be hospitalized. Uh, am I doing the right thing? What do you guys think? Yeah, I completely agree. Um, as much as possible, um, we are trying to use steroid sparing treatments or treatments other than steroids. That said, if the patient needs steroids, then I think that's okay. Just um, following all of the um, sort of public health recommendations and the isolation that really any patient should be following. Um, but yes, overall, um, I'd like everyone to know that our results in pediatrics are very reassuring and that most children with IBD are seeming to do very well, even if they get COVID. 
Yeah, I'm not treating IBD much different in April as I would have in February. Um, I think that I can be reassured by the, the early data we have both in the um, small number of kids with IBD who have developed COVID as well as the larger number of kids without IBD um, who have developed COVID. And generally it's, uh, it, 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 it's much more of a, a mild uh, disease. So I think you know, the, 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 the general parameters for treating pediatric IBD are um, treat the disease into remission maintain remission as always um, do so in a way that can minimize uh, exposure to corticosteroids um, and you know i i, I want to echo what uh, what erica alluded to um, the importance of physical distancing um, you know remains paramount um, not just for the benefits to a patient with pediatric IBD, but for the public health benefit of it. Um, the only way that, uh, that we are going to prevent a surge um, is if we all act socially responsible and keep our physical distances. Um, and so I tell many of my patients, I'm not that much worried about you and your um, pediatric Crohn's and your infliximab as I am about you know, the rest of the world or the rest of our town um, you might get it and be asymptomatic and spread it to someone else who spreads it to someone else. And so the uh, um, physical distancing is as important for public health as it is for individual patient health. And the one thing I would just want to add as the adult gastroenterologist in the room, um, and taking care of adults and, and elderly patients with IBD, is that you know many of the comments um, I echo in the adult um, realm. And I think the key thing, and, and we've been saying this actually going back to earlier webinars, um, is that if you're in remission right now, um, whatever is keeping you in remission, stay on that to stay in remission um, because that means that you're, well, we don't see major signals against the drugs that you're using right now to keep yourself in, in remission, um, the biologics, immunomodulators. Um, and if you were to stop them, then there is a risk of flaring. And then all of a sudden you need to have contact with the healthcare system and that increases your risk of exposure to the virus. And then we might have to use, still use things like steroids um, or other therapies um, to treat active disease. And we think that's a scenario where things are the hardest to, to manage. And having said all of that, despite all this, I'm still caring for people who are actively flaring right now. People are flaring um, in April 2020, like they did in April 2019. Um, and I have prescribed prednisone in some of these patients who are very, very sick, because we have to balance the risk of the severity of their disease against the perceived potential risk of, of the steroids in a setting where the, it is one of the key options we have to control their disease. The big difference between April 2020 and April 2019 is I'm shielding those individuals. I'm telling them, you know, if we have to use this, I'm gonna to try to use the lowest amount of dose that we can. I'm gonna to try to get you off as quickly as we can. But once you're on it, you need to be at home, isolated. Your family members need to consider that they don't want to be bringing the, the virus to you. And we go through and carefully talk through self-isolation um, protocols to, to help and support them um, as well. Yeah, and I'd refer people to the the website where that pyramid is there and explains all of that, depending on what medicine you're on and, and what your risk factors are. So as we wrap up, Gil, uh, all really interesting data uh, from this registry, uh, really great work, Mike and Erica. Uh, and everybody involved. How how should how can patients visualize and track things as they develop? Right, this is just one one moment in time, and I'm sure things are going to develop as we go forward. Uh, how can patients visualize things? So if um, I can share my screen. Oh, perfect. Um, so this this is um, the map, and I think Mike eloquently and very kindly um, mentioned how so many people reached out to him to try to help him um, uh, develop um, different. Um, things to help them to develop the, the database. And I was the same thing when I had this situation where I felt kind of helpless, out of control. I wanted to do something to help patients with IBD. Um, part of that led us to the work that we're doing with the COVID task force and these webinars. Um, but I reached out to Mike and Erica and to Ryan and asked them, you know, our research group, you know, this is what we do. Um, 
before the COVID pandemic, we, we build out these visualization displays. Can we build out a map um, for you, for your patients, for all the stakeholders? And so right here, you can see the link to the map right here. The QR code is there and it'll bring you to our website, which you'll see right here. Um, and there's, and you can actually follow this. So every, I think three to five, every three days or so, or three times a week, um, uh, our my uh, health geographer, Fox Underwood, who has built and developed this entire map, works with the analysts at UNC, Xi'an, um, to um, upload the database. You can see this was um, updated here on April 22nd. There were 704 cases. You can see, um, you can actually go to different parts of the world and look to see what's happening in, in Canada. You can see what's happening in uh, New York City where there's um, 83 cases. Um, and, and this is up being updated on a regular basis. There's a lot of functionality here. So you can see back here on March 13, the very first case that went into the registry. Um, and then um, you can actually track Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis um, cases across time and uh, you can see here on April 21st there were 409 Crohn's patients and 271 ulcerative colitis patients. You can look at oh, country. Your screen is no longer being shared. shared. Oh, um, does, does everyone see it now? <laughs> yeah, your desktop. We can see your desktop. Okay. So that, that, the, um, That's the other screen probably. Okay, what about there you yeah, go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and, I, and I'll try to be uh, relatively quick because I see that we're running short on time too. But you can see the countries, you can see that US has the most cases of IBD, and importantly, there actually hasn't been any deaths in the United States. We can also look at the age distributions, um, and, and again, as, as Mike and Erica mentioned, the, the, the age group that does the worst are people who are, are older. Um, we can also look at treatments, so people are asking about medications, and we were talking about um, anti-TNF therapies, um, and you can see that there is 220 people who've been on anti-TNF therapy um, to treat their, their IBD. Um, you can also um, look at the, at the different countries, and over here you can see Crohn's disease, you can see the activity distribution, and really importantly here, this actually tells you a little bit about the database, um, and if you are somebody who um, is reporting a case, you can actually click here and it brings you right to um, the, the database um, and you can actually go in here and report your case directly into the secure database. Um, similarly, you can tweet here um, and, and if you want to look at some of the other maps that our, our group has done, and really again, this is Fox Underwood, our health geographer, you can click onto our website here and look at that one as well. So I'll, I'll pause there and give the screen back to... And, and just to clarify, Gil, when you, you have to be a physician to report a case, right? So that's, that's a key part here is that uh, only the physicians can report cases. Uh, so if you have COVID-19, speak to your physician about reporting one of these cases and, and contribute to the, the knowledge that we've got going forward. And so I think last question for, for Mike and Erica. Um, where do you see the secure IBD registry going from here? You've, you've sort of said a little bit about it, but what's your next big step, do you think? So it's my hope that as more cases, cases accumulate and as we acquire more data, we'll be able to more specifically identify the medications that might be associated with either a higher risk of worse outcomes with COVID or potentially a protective risk, uh, because not only have we asked providers to um, tell us what medicines their patients are taking, but we're also asking about dosing and frequency of medicines and a lot of really specific information about those medicines. So as we have more data, then I hope we'll be able to provide a little bit more specific information about which medicines may be safer and which medicines may be less safe. So I think that would be sort of on the horizon, one thing that I'm thinking about. And the other is a sort of a secure version too, and, and our group and others have already been uh, sort of doing some early planning for, you know, what happens after um, this passes? Do patients develop antibodies against coronavirus? Are those antibodies protective? Um, what are the factors that make one patient more likely or less likely to develop um, longstanding uh, immunologic protection uh, against uh, coronavirus or, or something, uh, something like that? Um, and you know, what are the long-term disabilities, if any, that uh, the patients have um, after the uh, the recovery phase and are 
um, IBD patients more or less likely to have long lasting effects from this. Yeah, no, that's great. And I think uh, with that, we'll wrap up. We're right at 8.30. So maybe uh, thank you very much again, Mike and Erica, for joining us. We really appreciate it. The work you're doing is very, very highly valued. Uh, and you both as healthcare workers, we're thanking you, but in particular about, you know, this this project that you've helped develop uh, is outstanding. And I think the the community, the Crohn's colitis community, truly appreciate it. Well, thank, thank you, you again us. for having us. Thank you so much. Um, and, and as we are coming to the uh, end of, of this week's webinar, um, you know, Eric and I always want to, to end um, by thanking the healthcare uh, workers and you know there's so many different people involved but today I actually want to specifically um, thank um, healthcare workers who are in long-term care facilities what we used to call nursing homes um, uh, they've had a really tough go of things across the world right now it's not an easy job and uh, on a purely personal note my, my wife's grandmother who was 97 uh, passed away uh, last week and she was in a long-term care facility uh, in, in Toronto and you know over the weeks as she, her health was deteriorating um, we kind of experienced the challenges that many Canadians and people all over the world right now who are losing loved ones in, in long-term care facilities the challenge is being able to go and visit people um, and I have to, to say the experience I had with the physicians, the nurses, the LPNs, everyone, the cleaning staff there um, who supported um, Joanne's grandmother and Joanne's mother and her family through this process were un unbelievable. And I just want to personally thank them and every long-term care facility healthcare worker who's currently um, caring for somebody in a nursing home today. Yeah, I would echo that. I mean, I think we've given good news and we're getting good news in Canada about how we flatten the curve and how things are get, getting better and how, you know, maybe we're going to be able to open up soon. I think, unfortunately, the long-term care facilities are really the the not good news that we've experienced here in Canada so far. And uh, we're going to have to continue to protect our elderly population and our seniors who are in long-term care facilities and all the workers who are in long-term care facilities. Who are overworked and exposed to this virus on a daily basis so thank you all for the work that you do and and the reason that we're now physically distancing is to protect those vulnerable people so with that we'll say good night and i hope that you join us again next week and in subsequent weeks we have some ideas planned for next week we're not going to reveal them quite yet but you'll be able to get them on the crohn's and colitis.ca website and of course remember please 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 donate uh donate to crohn's and colitis canada if you found this worthwhile and useful, uh, particularly donate through the gutsywalk.ca website, and you can find our COVID IBD webinars uh, team page there. And there's a QR code with a link, uh, very much appreciated. If you have any money to spend, I know that it's, it's tough times right now, but if you can, please, please donate. Thank you very much, everybody, and have a great week. Thank you.